We're in a new sermon series called what? Missional living, right? Living each day with God. And last week I shared with you guys, uh, we were not made to add to God's mission. God is already doing his mission. We call that what in Latin? Missio Day, right? Missio Day, the mission of God. God is already doing his mission. You and I, we are just called to engage with his mission, uh, not to add to it. We're just called to be engaged by him and to be engaged with him, all right? That was what I shared last week. Today, uh, I will be talking about, if we can get the sermon title up, Loving Our City. All right, this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, If you guys will, open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Verses 6 to 8. All right, let's read it all with a loud voice. Ready? Begin. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Amen? Back in April, uh, Pastor Kevin, Pastor Phil, Pastor Chungmin, and I, uh, the four of us, we flew to uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, And I was really excited to go. All of us were excited to go, and we realized there's really nothing in Nashville uh, to look at. It's it's quite, uh, other than the Pantheon, it's quite empty. Uh, there's good food. Uh, they have good southern food. But uh, we went there for a conference called Q. And uh, Q is just a nonprofit Christian organization that asks questions about the church and today's culture. Where do they collide? How do they collide? Um, is culture affecting the church or is church affecting the culture? And so this conference called Q, uh, it, it was started by a guy named Gabe Leons. And he and another guy, uh, David Kinneman, who is in charge of the Barner Group, which is like a study st- statistical group uh, in the U.S., in California, uh, they kind of teamed up together to start this conference. And um, the first person that actually shared with us was a pastor from Houston, Texas. His name is Chris C. Do you guys know what happened in Houston back in 2015? Or was it 2016? Hurricane... Har V, right, struck Houston, um, and a lot of a lot of places were uh, were were impacted uh, by Hurricane Harvey. Um, C- Pastor Chris C and his church called Ecclesia Church, uh, they were actually one of the first responders to the people in the city of Houston before Red Cross even got there. And the reason why Pastor Chris C's church was able to do this was because they were already serving the city of Houston. They already had places and a network in place where they could send their church people out to help all the people who were stuck on the rooftops of their homes while the streets were being flooded in the city of Houston. They were the first ones to go out there to help these people because their church was already helping their city. Um, And basically the core of Chris C.'s talk was, it's the title of, of today's sermon, is just loving your city, loving our city. That's just basically, basically what he was talking about. Um, and today, I kind of wanted to unpack two things for us about loving our city. Why should we love our city? And how should we love our city? That's just what I would like to unpack for us today. Um, in today's passage, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, uh, we call this Jesus' mandate for missional living, right? Uh, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, Right? He was resurrected not too long before this time, uh, and he's about to be ascended into his kingdom, uh, and, and, and it's, his, it's his final moments with the disciples. And in his final moments with the disciples, he commands them. He says, uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. But before this, in verses 6 and 7, Uh, Jesus has this short conversation with his disciples. Before Jesus goes, the disciples ask him, Lord, right in verse 6, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus' disciples right now, they are curious about the kingdom of God. Um, 
because that's what they were anticipating. You guys know that the Jews in the first century, uh, who, who, who was ruling at that time? Which empire? The Roman Empire was ruling at that time. And a lot of the Jews believed that the Messiah, uh, the so-called Messiah from the Old Testament, when they, when they would come, that that Messiah would free them from the oppression of the Roman Empire and that the Messiah's kingdom would reign over the Roman Empire. And so they thought that this new kingdom was going to come about um, immediately after, uh, you know, Jesus' resurrection. And, and think about it, man. They just witnessed one of the greatest miracles, if not the greatest miracle in all of human history. Jesus come back to life from the dead, resurrected. He's standing before them, alive with the wounds in his hands, his feet on his side and everything. And the Jews are like, they're waiting, they're anticipating. They're like, oh my goodness, this is it. It's going to happen now. Dude came back to life. Kingdom's got to come soon, right? And so they're asking him, Lord, uh, when will this happen? Will you restore at this time the kingdom to Israel? And I think you and I, as, as human beings, as people, you and I, when we want something new, do you guys take time or do you guys want it right away? We want it right away. If it takes time, you and I, we don't want it anymore, right? What is... What's the stat for us focusing on a website? If a website doesn't load in how many seconds? Is it three seconds? I think it's less than that. Yeah, it's about a second. If, if a web page doesn't load as quickly, you start clicking the refresh button or you, you, know, you, you, you go to a different website. You're like, well, this one doesn't seem to be working that well. And, and we kind of switch off uh, you know, to a different place. We like things immediately. Netflix. Netflix, not bustle, man. Netflix is bad. It encourages binge watching, right? And, and how many of you guys binge watch? Raise your hands, be honest. We're at church. <laughs> All right? When you watch an episode and then you watch another episode and then you watch another episode, that's why they come out with the entire seasons, right? Other TV, TV uh, 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 companies, they come out with an episode per week or so, and then you have to wait mid-season, and then they have a break, and then they come back again. But Netflix, when they come out with the season, it's like 13 to 18 episodes all at once. And so right when it comes out, you're like, oh, my goodness, here we go. And then you start, you press the play button, and it auto-plays the next episode, and you just keep going until you're like, oh, my gosh, I have to wake up in two hours for school. Um, we are like this. This is our generation, right? I think even when I think about the MCU, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, when I think about Star Wars, you and I, we can't wait anymore. It's so funny how they realize that people just, they can't wait that long. And so in order to keep anticipating the next big movie, Star Wars and the MCU, they now have started this trend in, 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 in the movie cinematic uh, uh, arena where they come up with all of these little mini spin-offs or these like solo stories that lead up or are part of uh, to the main big one, right? And so for those of you who have watched Infinity War, hands? Yeah. Can you guys wait to watch the next one? Oh, you can wait. Oh, that's okay. You, you can wait. It's worth it now. Um, but in between then, what's coming out? Ant and Wasp, or Ant-Man and, and the Wasp, right? What else? Captain Marvel. Yeah, the Spider-Verse one's coming out. Anyway, when you look at this, they're like filling in the gaps because they know that you and I, our patience, we don't have as much as our parents used to have. Everything that we want, we want it to come quickly. And I believe the disciples were kind of in similar shoes. They were anticipating Jesus' kingdom to come right in that moment. Like I said, Jesus is no longer dead. He came back to life. He has been resurrected. And now they're thinking, man, if, this, if, if God can bring his son back to life, that kingdom is coming Right here, right now. It should be coming soon. That's what they say. But in verse 7, Jesus' response to his disciples, this is what he says. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, Jesus is saying, uh, it's not, you might want it to come right now, but God will make his kingdom come in his time, in his season, which is the Greek word for kairos, uh, meaning God will make it happen in his time, not in our time by how we want it, but in his time. And until God's kingdom comes, until God brings his kingdom through here, in, in, you know, building a new city here, 
Until then, Jesus gives them this mandate, this command of missional living. He says in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. When Jesus says, you will receive power, stay here in Jerusalem, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to come down upon you. Once that happens, they are to be Jesus' witnesses, and where is the place to start? Where is it? Jerusalem. Do you guys know why? It is the Holy Land, but do you guys know why Jerusalem? There are some pastors who have preached on this passage, and um, there, there, there are two parties about what Jesus meant by Jerusalem. Um, I'm on the side that Jerusalem, um, when Jesus is talking about Jerusalem, some people, they, when they talk about this passage, they'll be like, oh yeah, you know Jerusalem, your Jerusalem is your family. Your Jerusalem is your home. And, and it, it could be. It could be. But usually they talk about Jerusalem as a place of comfort. Like, you know, loving your city, loving our city like it's supposed to be like that. Yeah, you know, because it's where we're from. It's where we're at. It's, it's where we are and familiar people, familiar places and so forth and all of those things. But I'm on actually the other side where if you think about Jerusalem and what happened in Jerusalem before Jesus ascended into heaven, Jerusalem was not the greatest place to be as a follower of Jesus Christ. What happened in Jerusalem? What happened in Jerusalem? Can we get the map up there? Uh, this is Jerusalem. The orange lines are the boundaries of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem during Jesus' time. Okay? The orange lines, that was how big and how far Jerusalem had gotten. Over here to the, the right of the screen is Mount of Olives. That's where Jesus went to pray. Uh, the Garden of Gethsemane is, is believed to be at the very base of of the Mount of Olives, and then as he leaves there, John tells us in his gospel, Jesus and his disciples, after praying, they walk down to the Kidron Valley, which is right in between Mount of Olives and Israel, the, or I mean, the, the city of, of Jerusalem, and they go into Kidron Valley, and that's where Judas the Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, and the Roman soldiers meet him. And that's where Jesus is arrested. And then they go into the city of Jerusalem, and that's where Jesus is tried, by Caiaphas, the high priest, uh, Pilate, King Herod was visiting Jerusalem, and he got to meet Jesus during that time. And then finally in Jerusalem, probably the saddest moment in all of history, was that was where Jesus was prepared before they led him to Golgotha, which is north of Jerusalem at the very top there where you see New City. Uh, that the, 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 the pink boundary, don't worry about that. That wasn't there at that time. But just right outside of the orange lines um, of the northern gate uh, was Golgotha. And that's where we believe where Jesus was crucified. Right? He was led outside of the city of Jerusalem to be crucified. Jerusalem was anywhere but a place where the disciples of Jesus wanted to be. That was probably the most likely place where the disciples of Jesus would have been persecuted for their Christian faith. Again, all of the events that led up to this moment uh, was the moment where the Jews in Jerusalem halted and tried to stop Jesus' ministry. But, interestingly, Jesus tells his disciples, when the Holy Spirit comes down on you, you're going to receive the power from the Holy Spirit. And when you do, you are going to be my witnesses. And the place for you to start is going to be Jerusalem. Before you go all throughout Judea and Samaria to the neighboring regions, before you go to the ends of the earth, I want you to start in Jerusalem. It's a very interesting command because it's probably the least likely place we want to go. You and I, what city are we in? Surrey. Our church community is in Surrey. Now, if I were to ask you the question, how comfortable are you going out into the streets of Surrey and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone in Surrey, how comfortable would you be? Not very comfortable. I, I think a lot of us, even though we are a large Korean church community, dominantly Korean uh, church community, uh, Surrey is anything but Korean. Uh, we got Hanam Market. We got Doni. We got uh, Jintu, I can never say the name of that restaurant. Jintu Sung Chan, is that right? Jintu Sung Chan? Is that right? Yeah, Jintu Sung Chan. That's, that's a hard name to say, man. That's, a, that's difficult. Anyway, but outside of those places, the city of Surrey, eh, no, it, it ain't Lowheed. You know, it's not Coquitlam, definitely not even close to. 
It's anything but that, right? And when you and I, when we walk out onto the streets of Surrey, how comfortable are you being Jesus' witnesses in this city? Not that comfortable. Even though this city is familiar to us, some of you guys were born here, right? Some of you guys are raised here. This is your hometown, Surrey. And yet, even though it's our hometown, even though it's the city of our church community, I would say, I, I would dare to argue that the city of Surrey, for us as Christians here at GCC, we're not that comfortable being Jesus' witnesses here. Am I right? Yeah, it's not that easy. So what does it mean to love your city? Jemuth, what I mean, what I, what I believe it means to love your city is this. Loving our city begins in the greatest places of discomfort. I think this is why Jesus' teachings, his commands are always very difficult because they, they really pierce us at the core of our hearts. Like we don't want to exit out of our places of comfort. We like places of comfort. And yet still Jesus tells his disciples, you go and be my witnesses, but I want you to start in Jerusalem where, yes, you might not be the most comfortable, but disciples, listen to me, that is where these people need me the most. So share me with them. That one pastor at the end of Youth Coast on that last night, he said, you and I, Jesus commands us to be the salt and the light of the world. But how can we picture Jesus' light when you and I don't go into the places of darkness? When we don't go into the places where they are spiritually dark, how can we exercise being the light of Christ and sharing the light of Christ if we don't go to these places? And I think that's why Jesus challenges his disciples. He says, hey guys, when the Holy Spirit comes down upon you and you are filled with his power, Go straight to Jerusalem. Stay, well, don't go straight because they're already in Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem. Start there. Be my witnesses. Start there. In the greatest place of discomfort. Why? Because that's where people need Christ the most. My dad used to take us out when I was your age uh, to downtown Las Vegas. You guys who have been to my city, my hometown, um, you, you've probably never really, how many of you guys have actually gone to downtown Las Vegas? You guys know where downtown is? Mostly people just go to the strip. You guys, downtown? So when I talk about Fremont Street experience, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Four Queens, Binion's Horseshoe, Borgi. Yeah, these are all ghetto hotels, man. Don't go there, all right? It's a dangerous area. Um, but downtown Las Vegas is infested with a lot of homeless people. Um, and my home church in Vegas once a month, uh, the first Saturday of every month, my dad would gather some youth kids, uh, Sunday school kids, and parents, and we all went together. Uh, we would spend an entire Saturday from like 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. Uh, prepping food at church, packing all of our church buses, uh, and then all of us would go to downtown Las Vegas, and we would set up tables. Um, and we did this quite regularly where we had regulars that came. Um, and we would go there, and we would just feed the homeless. And we would feed the homeless until about 5 p.m., and then we would pack everything up, clean everything up, and go back to church. And we did this uh, for, for a time, for a season. We did this on a monthly basis, like the first Saturday of every month. Um, and I told you guys, like, being out there and, and sharing Jesus with people, because I started when I was in grade 3. Um, they, for the young ones, they gave us the, the responsibility to hand out tracts. Do you guys know that? handing out these little sheets of paper that talk about the gospel, and then you're supposed to share it with someone and give it to them. And if they're curious, you know, you can read it together and whatnot. I was in grade three. We were walking downtown. I was with Misty Jondosanyi, my, my Sunday school uh, pastor, and we were walking down there. And I saw this gentleman. He seemed kind at first. And so I approached him, and I was like, sir, do you know Jesus? And he looked at me, and he just lifted up his middle finger and said, F you, kid. And I was like, you know, wait, wait, oh, you're grade three. I was eight years old, eight years old. Right? And I didn't know people responded like this to Jesus. And I just looked at, I was frozen. I looked at, I didn't know what to do. I was just, okay, I, you know, I'm sorry for bothering you. Da, da, da. That, that, was, that was homeless ministry. It was a place of discomfort. It was not an easy thing to do. Sharing Jesus with people who needed him, but they didn't know that they needed him, uh, it, that was difficult. It was not an easy thing to do. But once in a blue moon, once in a blue moon, you would come across a homeless person in downtown Las Vegas, you know, some of the homeless people, did they smell? Yes. Other homeless people, were they aggressive? Yes. I remember this one gentleman, uh, like he would go to the front of the line and he would cut people three, four times. 
Like you're only supposed to get your first serving and then once everyone has gone, then you can get your seconds and your thirds if there's leftover food. Couldn't this Haraboji, because he was like a senior, I don't know, maybe he thought he had the right to cut the line. And I remember he just, so we had some aggressive people. And then there were people that were extremely high, uh, you know, either, either marijuana or they were on crack. You could, you could just tell by their jitteriness. Um, and and, and it, was, it was not easy. But then once in a blue moon, you would have that one homeless person who would come through the line. They would look like anyone else. Um, and then you would hear their life story. And this happened to me in, in high school. I believe it was grade 9, grade 8 to grade 9 that summer, uh, moving from middle school to high school. That year, I met someone who had gone to church, stopped going, uh, divorced from their wife and their family. The wife took the custody of the children. The husband couldn't get another job and just ended up being homeless on the streets of Las Vegas. Um, and he used to go to one of the Baptist churches in Vegas, um, but just stopped going. And it was interesting to meet that man because what happened was he was the one who shared with us, every month when you guys come here, I see that Jesus that I learned about when I was at church, when I was younger. You guys give me hope to keep trying for the next month until I see you guys again. Like once in a blue moon, you would meet those types of people. And we, we prayed for him. Um, I saw him maybe three months straight, and then I didn't see him after that. Uh, but we would hope to see them again all the time. But this is loving our city. It's, it's, it's not always going to be the most comfortable place. It won't always be the most comfortable setting. For those of you who have done Kaleo when we went out onto the streets, how many of you guys tried praying for people when we went out on the streets? Yeah? Was it comfortable or, or difficult? difficult, right? I remember this once. I, I can't remember who it was, but there was one of our younger sisters in Christ, and uh, I remember she came up to me because we were in front of Safeway and Save on Foods uh, with the food stations, and one of our younger sisters came up to me. I remember her just saying, Pastor Josh, this is so hard. I don't know what to say. Like, I want to pray for them, but I don't know how to pray for them, so I just follow them, and I just pray for them while I follow them, you know, like, without telling them that they're praying for them. They just give them the care pack, and then while they're on their way, like, Jesus, please bless this mom, you know, like, bless this mom. It's not an easy thing to do. It's very difficult. It is not an easy thing to love our city, but the thing is, is Jesus gave us the mandate in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, go and be my witnesses, continue my ministry, but don't go to the places of comfort but please go to the places where you might feel uncomfortable because most likely in that space, you will meet people who really need me and you need to go out there being my witnesses to share me with the people who need me. That is missional living, Jemnu. Missional living doesn't always happen in places of comfort. If this is where God planted our church community here in the city of Surrey, don't you think, don't you think, that God brought us here because out of all the cities, like, you know, Pastor Park and our church board, they could have, they could have planted the church in Burnaby. Right? Go quit them. Anywhere else uh, but here. But we ended up in Surrey. And if you think about Surrey, if you know Surrey, one of the first things I learned coming to Surrey was Josh. And this, this, was, this, was, this was like six years ago when I first came. Josh, lock your doors. Don't ever leave your car unlocked. Not in Fleetwood. People will steal things. And I was like, what? Come on, man. It's Canada. Everyone's nice here, right? Everyone's so kind. Who would want to steal? And they're like, not Surrey. Surrey's different. You know, this isn't Abbotsford. This isn't Chilo. Like, this is Surrey, Josh. Crime happens, right? We know our city, guys. I lived in Surrey for, I think, I'm, I'm moving to Scott Road in three weeks. Like, <laughs> Oh, man, like, what is this, right? Surrey, this is Surrey. We know this city. It has quite the reputation. And I think it is not a coincidence that God, by his authority, in his time, in his season, would plant a church like ours in a city that desperately needs him. One of the things that God has been putting on my heart is, Josh, have you been loving your city? The city of Surrey. And honestly, I know for the last two years, because... I really miss that when we were putting together the care packs and handing them out to the moms, sandwiches, because I remember some moms, that there was that one mom, if you guys remember, walking by Safeway, she had three kids, right? And she saw one pack, and she was like, can I just take three more, one for each of my children? And we're like, yes, of course you can, by all means, right? Just helping a family out in a city that desperately needs to see the light of Jesus Christ. 
Right? Like, I really miss doing that. And I don't care if we don't have Kaleo this year. We're going to do it. Amen? We're going to go. Love our city. Go to the places of discomfort and just love on our city because that is what Christ commands us to do. This is missional living. This is Jesus' mandate for missional living. He doesn't say go to the places of comfort. He says go to Jerusalem, disciples. You will be persecuted. You will face persecution. But go there because that's where they need me the most. Because Jesus was stopped by his own people. It wasn't even the Romans. It was the Jews that stopped Jesus. And they were trying to stop his ministry. But yet, even though they were like his enemies, Jesus still wanted to send his disciples to bless those Jews because he knows how desperately they need him. This is loving our city. For those of you who have not been thinking about the donations that we will be giving to the Surrey Women's Center, the reason why we keep giving to the Surrey Women's Center is because they are in our city. Amen? It's important for us to bless them. If you want to be the light of Christ, guys, even if it's just one thing, a pack of diapers, something that a mom needs desperately, just bring that. Why can't we give that to them? We get shoes, we get new clothes, we get things from time to time, but why can't we just just look at it, take a look at it, pray about it. If God is moving your heart to bring something and to donate something, bring it. Donate it on that day so that we can bless those moms and their children. Um, I want to close on this note. Um, some of us might be scared to face places of great discomfort. I think a lot of us, we like our comfort zones. We like to be comfortable, especially in North America because we are a bit privileged and uh, we feel entitled that we deserve this life. Uh, you and I, I think it's hard for us to exit out of our comfort zones. Um, and so some of you, when I'm talking about places of discomfort, you might be like, PJ, I can't do that. Like, it, that's just too hard. I can't, I can't do that. And and, and rightfully so. You and I, we cannot do it. We can. Which is why Jesus says, wait here in Jerusalem. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. And then you will receive power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Jesus doesn't tell his disciples, you're going to do it by your power. He says, you're going to receive power from the Spirit of God, from God the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive it from him. And as you do, through his power, you will be able to do this missional work. Right? It's about doing it by the power given to us by the Holy Spirit. And, and I just want to close by sharing with you, what is that power that comes from the Holy Spirit? I believe it is this. The power that comes from the Holy Spirit, it is the confidence that God will work through us to bless our city, to transform our city, and to help people who are desperately in need of him. God will do it. That's where the power of the Holy Spirit comes from. It comes from the confidence that our God is faithful, He is good, and He will do it. Amen. Amen. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. Knowing with confidence, I can't do it, but God can, and He will. Now the thing is, just like we see in the Bible, whenever God does things to transform cities, to transform neighborhoods, to transform families, who does He do that through? us he did it through Jesus' disciples that God will do it it's his mission like I said we're not adding to God's mission God is already doing his mission here in the city of Surrey I believe that is why God planted our church here in the city of Surrey Jemu. right Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 he writes for God is working in you God is giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him, to join with Him on His mission. God will do it, Jemu. Because only God can do it. It's, it's only by His power. And the beauty of working with God and being engaged by Him is that it, it doesn't just have to happen within our church community, right? Loving your cities and, and engaging with the mission of God blessing people like it can happen in our schools it can happen in, in different community avenues and, and again I just want to I just want to point out for those of you who don't know like for Annie and, and Jacob this Wish Youth Network Society all right I'm not trying to promote them I was just blessed by it when I saw Jacob's posting um, like even this a, a nonprofit student-led organization that simply just wants to bless people right to put things together to bless local hospitals 
right? To bless different organizations. Like that, that is a part of the mission of God, amen? Right? And we can do that as Christians. Like the organization itself might not be Christian, but we as God's people can join with that and allow ourselves to be engaged with God's mission. And here's the funny thing is that when we do that, you might actually engage that organization with God's mission by showing them God's mission through those avenues. Ways to serve. Gem Youth, Christ is calling us to love on our cities. This is missional living. Discipleship. For those of you who are in student discipleship, these are the things that we should be questioning, thinking about. Man, how can we love our city? What can we do here in Gem Youth to really love our city? Maybe even beyond the Surrey Women's Center, doing different things. Like there are church communities in the states where they have uh, uh, this nonprofit organization that's like an extended arm of their church community, and they provide hot lunches to all the public schools for kids who cannot afford hot lunches at their schools. That's just being the light of Christ to people who are in need. Jam Youth, I really want uh, to see us love the city that God has placed our church community 